Oh, yeah. I'm, like, super excited about this one. It's He was on yesterday. Am I correct? Yes. Okay. So, you know, you guys know if you were there exactly what you're looking for. So, Robert uh, Strand is on today. Robert, hi. Hello. Welcome back. Hello. <laughs> Welcome back. And oh, we can't wait for your talk. Are you ready? Uh, my voice is weird. And I'm home alone with the dog and the neighbor is, you know, doing something into the concrete walls. So, yes, I, what can go wrong? <laughs> what well, could go wrong, yes. Uh, well, I don't hear anything now. And, uh, no, neither do I. Good. It sounds we, great. Okay, take it away. See. All right, thank you. Thank Let's you. see if I actually can share the screen as well. That's also a good idea. There yes. we go. Yes. So again, uh, my voice is kind of weird. So I'm I'm just gonna I'm just gonna hope that it it, it sticks with me throughout this talk. Uh, and also, I'm uh, a little bit pressed for time on this one, so it's kind of hard to wrap everything up. I tried a couple of times, and I had to remove a bunch of slides. So some of these things are gonna go a little bit fast, and then I'm gonna slow down on the more more important things. But uh, like mentioned, my name is Robert. I'm, uh, I talked yesterday, so it's really nice not not only to have my well first GitOps days uh, uh, presentations, but but having two of them. Um, so I'm still the head of platform engineering at Crayon. Uh, I'm an Azure MVP uh, and also a, a uh, HashiCorp ambassador. Um, so the, uh, the the topics that we're going to talk about today is related to my new job as a pl uh, head of platform engineering and where where we try to go when uh, when you think of uh, cloud native and obviously GitOps is part of that. So that's what I'm going to try to talk about in twenty something minutes. Anyway. Before I start with that, we kind of have to talk about what Crayon is because there's some there's some very specific things that are happening uh, because of who we are. So Crayon is uh, a relatively anonymous, anonymous company for most people, but it's actually 20 years old, and it was 10, 20 years old uh, this uh, this May. Um, it's a company that started in Oslo, Norway, uh, but are now literally we're literally have offices and everywhere. So it, Everyone is watching now probably has a crayon office in their country or maybe even right next door for all you know. Uh, we're spread from, we're spread from from uh, the far far west to the far east and everything in between. Um, we have uh, some of these numbers. I'm not even sure if they're correct to be honest because I just stole this from a marketing slide, and I think they are outdated before they managed to update it themselves. So uh, we have a lot of people doing a lot of things. I should say that. Um, what we are, we are focused on four uh, what we call service uh, uh, pillars. We mainly are doing uh, uh, where what we mainly did was license reselling and 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 cost optimization. Uh, that's where we started, but we added more things like uh, services uh, department that that are doing like the typical like uh, advisory, uh, cloud advisory, and and consultancy things. Uh, help people migrate to cloud. We also do a lot of data and AI and everything in between. And like I said, I have a dogger, so hold on. Nick. <laughs> she doesn't understand that I'm doing stuff. Uh, and uh, so these are like the, the four pillars of uh, of Crayon. This is what we're doing. And then we have Crayon Group on top, which is where, where I'm currently at. I used to be in Crayon Norway in services, so I was out at clients and did things. Now I'm trying to help everyone in crayon to do things in a in a better fashion um so we're going to start you know talk about like the the uh the, the cloud native journey and you know like where where does that start um I'm, it might sound like i'm complaining but it's not it's not complaining to be honest it's uh, it's just like this this is this is how it is and it's probably the same in a lot of organizations so like where did we start uh it's like seeing where we need like where do we start like doing some changes um one thing that kind of crept up or or we saw which i to be honest i see i seen at basically all the companies that i've been with and that i've uh, had like some sort of advisory role with it's silos right that's like the the the, the, the famous thing like the, everything you know, we're trying to remove all these silos but everyone has them so there must be a reason for that and I think this is just this part of like natural growth of a company. Um, 
the things that we do now is nowhere near the same as what happened even five years ago in many cases and it it it, it's like totally natural that it ends up in this way of fashion because the, some of the decisions like take time to implement, obviously. Uh, so, you know, these always just happens uh, by themselves. So we have all our uh, consultants and services. They are doing things uh, in, in their pace and they're doing things with their own code and everything like that. All the different subsidiaries, so all the different countries, uh, they have initiatives that they're doing. And even internally, like our in-house development team, who's doing some uh, many of the the bigger products that we're doing and services that we have, and the operations were also split into two. So, uh, on one end, we're trying to do modern IT things. At the same time, everyone has to like reinvent the wheel over and over again. Um, the reason why it's like that is probably because there's no simple solutions to what we do because we're you know we're not a like one customer facing product like a a social media or a certain service there's no one thing that we do we have four or five different customer facing services and we have internal services we have uh, products that are specific just for uh, for internal uh, use or or just partners so there's no one way of uh, of dealing with all of these things um, like how can you solve everyone's issue on all different types of architectural like uh, uh, models and like it just doesn't work right so that's partly the reason why everything is the way that it is and um, we need to solve things in such a flexible way so that we not only allow people to do what's the best for the things that they're developing but we also need to have some sort of control right um, and when I pull this quote up I'm, I'm sure most of you are aware uh, of what this is this is Conway's law and it's one of those things where uh, it's really funny how uh, Melvin Conway in 1967 could speak these words and it seems to be still actually true today and it's one of the few things that are considered a law or a principle or thing or things you reference to when you're trying to explain things to people that is actually accurate it seems um, and, and the quote is organizations who design systems are constrained to produce designs which are copies of the communication structure of these organizations and obviously this is written in 67 so it's kind of like weirdly weirdly put but uh, i think it still holds true so if you have a uh, a team structure that kind of seems like this monolithic big thing where with little flexibility in between that's what you're going to end up having if you have much smaller teams doing uh, different parts of a larger system you're probably going to end up with something that looks like a, a, you know, a microservice architecture or just you know design driven uh, design uh, you know, it doesn't obviously have to be correlated directly in, in that sense, but but it seems to ring through, and it, we see that also in the, the systems that we have now developed, they kind of resemble the teams that have designed them. So, you know, what do you do with this? Well, when we're starting to move away from this, we're uh, trying out something called inverse Conway maneuver, and uh, so instead of letting Conway's law define find our uh, systems we would rather see that this like how how do where do we want to go where do we want our systems to be and how do we want them to look and then rather design the organization based on that so you know we don't have these like restrictions that we get from from something like Conway's law um, and this means creating more teams perhaps smaller teams, more autonomous teams, uh, all, all the buzzwords at the same time, we need to do DevOps, we need to do cloud native development, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so obviously, uh, if we give people the um, uh, responsibility to do their own operations on their, their own developed uh, uh, software, they also need to have uh, both the flexibility to choose wherever they wanna go, but they need help to do some of the decisions but 
they also need some tools. They need to have uh, some sort of, uh, for instance, you have SREs that are doing uh, monitoring and, and everything related to scalability and, and stability to help these teams uh, to be able to operate their own software without having to, you know, everyone again reinventing the wheel all the time everywhere. And a lot of these like internal services would have to come from somewhere. And that's kind of where the platform engineering team comes into play. Um, so it is a brand new team. It, it, this type of team hasn't existed at Crayon in its 20 year uh, in your history. Uh, and it's, uh, well, I and mean, currently it's a team of one. So hello, I am platform engineering. Uh, but, but I'm happy to say that we are hiring people and we're gonna do a lot of cool stuff. Um, but but obviously it needs to start somewhere, right? So uh, we we need people that have different types of experience than what we already have in, inside of the company uh, because we want to do stuff like creating the, the the internal developer platform, which people probably know about. There's going to be there's going to be API uh, for uh, for um, for a lot of things and a lot of internal services, and we're going to help. Uh, we're, one of the things that we're doing is uh, structuring the architecture. So we're using Azure. Uh, we're following the cloud adaption framework and the enterprise scale architecture model. Uh, this means that uh, basically you 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 set up all your platform uh, services in, in in its own part of Azure. And, and for instance, like the, the identity, connectivity and the management parts you know, have that under control under the platform landing zones. And then for each team, product, or however you want to slice it, you you have landing zones, which they get access to, which they can do whatever they want. But obviously through policies and everything like that, you, you guide people in the right direction, but you give them that flexibility. For these landing zones, we don't want people to sit literally in the portal, just like clicking new subscription and, and do everything manually. So people should be able to, whenever there's a new project, whenever they need a new landing zone, they should just say, I want a new landing zone and go through an API and all the uh, automation will solve uh, solve all those issues. Um, so we're doing some of these internal tooling and we're doing some of the architectural, like guiding people in the right direction. Obviously, always facilitating uh, uh, collaboration between the, you know, the security and the infrastructure people and so on and so forth but also doing like general guidelines and frameworks. Um, and one of the things we're gonna do, uh, and, and the, one of the ways that we're gonna do this internal developer platform is not just through Terraform, which is very, you know, uh, very um, much used from, from a Crayon perspective, but also GitOps. So the way that this is gonna work is um, is and again, this is a little bit more. It's it's a more advanced model. So most people will say, "All right, Terraform. Let's do Terraform. Let's create these different uh, root modules for different deployments and trial modules for different resource uh, um, uh, life cycles, etc., etc., etc." And then let's do all that deployment. Now, what we want to do is uh, also give uh, put in GitOps into this because GitOps for me is literally the, the, the future of like true, uh, true cloud operations. This is what will make us, uh, uh, you know, leap forward in, in the, from where we were like, like efficiency wise. And, you know, there's a reason why we are, you know, very much behind GitOps as a, as an operational model. But at the same time, since we, aren't a one team that's going to do things and we 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 don't want to have like explain to all the developers that are all different types of developers that are doing all different types of things how to do GitOps. we need to have that abstraction model so we're going to use GitOps as part of our technology stack for our automation platform and it's going to be supported by the tf controller from weworks that i talked about yesterday um these will be uh, the the basis for how everything uh, uh, gets deployed. And then we're gonna use Terraform as an integration tool. Uh, the nice thing about Terraform that all the integrations against all the different cloud vendors are there and it's a really well-known uh, tool in, in Crayon and we use it externally against customers. 
and we are doing all of these uh, shared um, we, we are doing like public uh, public facing modules we we have you know uh, code that is out at customers that we all collaborate between uh, both us and uh, in, like internally and and the, the um, external facing architects and, and uh, consultants uh, and in that way we can have this one shared way of doing infrastructure as code so you know by utilizing that we we, we share we have like this um, get this culture of, of, uh, of collaboration and knowledge sharing which is really important to do stuff um, Next part of the puzzle for this will be um, uh, what I call rolling production environments. It doesn't sound that fancy, and it's it's not really a new idea in itself. And uh, most people probably think uh, that uh, that this is the way to go now, as far as I can tell. I see a lot of people talk about this, but the idea here is that you know everything that we are doing is going to be run in a Kubernetes cluster of some sort. Uh, and instead of having dev stage test etc 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 we're obviously going to have dev environments right we need somewhere to do some of the, the dirty work and get stuff working but if there's a, a major new version of the uh, of the services that we are um, running or if for instance we want to do new versions of kubernetes etc we want to do uh, instead of having uh, two environments running you know, a stage and, and, and prod and making sure that the stage is always up to date and then pay twice for something which we don't need. Uh, we we rather want to make that, the set up that new cluster, your application deployment. And obviously, again, since everything is GitOps, uh, you know, everything is going to be uh, deployed in the same fashion all uh, over and over again. We're going to do our testing and then either do some sort of canary uh, or just like straight or crossover uh, um, deployment uh, and promote that cluster to production. Um, at that point, obviously, you can just delete the cluster that existed because, uh, you know, again, it's one of the, the great things about cloud native and and that's also one of the reasons why i i'm um, I'm, I'm i'm thoroughly like I'm, I'm pushing forward for crayon to be more cloud native because these just these things make sense now we don't only have um immutable infrastructure but we also are now going to have immutable environments uh and just just with that like as a basis it's uh, uh it just makes so much more sense it makes sense at, at a cost level uh because if we don't uh, have to run a you know pro exactly like production environment that we are only using to do you know small changes to make sure that the stuff isn't broken um uh, we if we don't need that you know that's that's half the cost and that's not it's not only half the cost like for us uh, like money wise but obviously it's uh, it's a less um, uh, a cost for both the environment and and the the uh, the uh, the pressure from from the two on the cloud uh, vendors to have stuff up and running so it's it's better not to use as many servers obviously um, so basically this went a little bit more faster than i thought i think uh, i think my voice kind of like uh slipped into gear so i just want to end with a thank you uh here are some links if you want to talk more specifically about platform engineering cloud native you know even devops and, and infrastructure as code or or GitOps, uh, feel free to reach out to me uh and uh, like i said we will be hiring platform engineers so that's a that's always a good thing do we have any questions on this? Thank you so much. Uh, it's really great to have you on both days. Um, mm -hmm. There is obviously a little bit of the delay yes. uh, for it to reach YouTube. So we'll just see if anybody has questions as your um, talk is wrapping up. I, I am also in the Slack. So uh, if people want to reach out, uh, you can do it there as well. 
Absolutely. Oh, yeah. And when I, when I meant YouTube, I meant the, the stream yep. is delayed, but in the YouTube chat, we have reminded people, and I just posted right now, um, to ask your questions in Slack because, yes, um, many of the speakers will continue yep. to monitor to Slack or will alert uh, the speakers about questions. So, you know, if you're um, registered and you got the link, uh, we have the stream open. So if you're watching this um, a couple days later or whatever, or mm -hmm. um, actually, I forgot to mention earlier, for accessibility reasons, um, you know, we choose uh, YouTube streaming so that I know we have short breaks, but if anybody wants to just pause and has to go to a meeting or, you know, needs more time, we want to provide that flexibility. So if you're catching this even 30 minutes later or a couple hours later, um, Slack is the best place and to ask your questions so that we can um, monitor them. Um, yeah. So one person asked, um, have you looked at Crossplane instead of Terraform Controller? Great question. Yes. Uh, so obviously, Crossplane is a really good way of doing things, and it's more Kubernetes specific, you know, because it, that's the, you know that's that's its venue, uh, and Terraform is not. But uh, the reason why we're going with Terraform is just that that we are a Terraform first company. We are creating a lot of uh, our like. Um, we're doing AWS landing zones design there. We're going to do a lot of like accelerated kits for customers and everything is going to be Terraform. And it just makes more sense uh, as a company to kind of have that one approach uh, uh, rather than us then splitting off again and doing cross-plane. Uh, cross-plane is excellent and is really good and it's very very easy to get into that 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 GitOps uh, operating model but again uh, since we have the TF controller now uh, it, it's it's just as easy just to have what we already are using and can reuse that but in a GitOps uh, manner yeah and I will take this opportunity to plug two things. Um, one plug is, yes, uh, as, as mentioned, the Terraform controller, and we are soft mentioning that um, it works with Terraform Cloud and Terraform Enterprise. Our team mm. has been working with that, and we'll have a full like, official launch about much more of what's going on there um, a couple months from now. But um, yes, officially, um, uh, it works on those. Uh, and then on the cross-plane side, plug here, so my time, Pacific time, um, 11.50, we are very happy to have um, Victor Farsik from Upbound, yeah. who will be talking about Flux working with cross-plane. So yes, many, many options, and uh, we are excited about all of them. It's, it's, it's one of those things, like I said, like one size doesn't fit all, like it never does. And there's, there's a lot of reasons to, to consider many of these tools. Uh, that we're just lucky that basically all these different tools, for some reason, all seem to work really good. So we're in a, we're in a, good, we're in a good spot in, the, in our ecosystem. So it's yes. really good. Absolutely. Um, and then we have, oh, I guess, just a, a comment, um, you know, mm. really helpful. Um, thank you again, the people saying, you know, thanks for sharing your journey. Um, yeah, yep. you not just share, shared um, what you're doing, but, you know, how things, uh, what the next steps are. And I think that's really important for people to think about what they're doing and then also um, clues on what's critical. So thank you for that as well. It's, there's, there's a lot of things to talk about in a short amount of time. I can probably have a two hour seminar about these things, but, but yes, it, there's a lot of these things that I see or have seen at a lot of customers, all these types of uh, trying to, to, to continue, to have continuous uh, improvements when you're kind of stuck in that old type of uh, like structure is really hard. And unfortunately, the only good way to deal with that is to start breaking it up. Uh, and uh, yeah, like I said, I could probably talk for hours about that topic alone <laughs> yeah. and uh, without mentioning any technical things. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and uh, uh, we'll, we'll keep that in mind uh, for yeah. future things that we want to do. Um, yeah. Another, what's the difference um, I guess, what's the difference between um, a platform engineering squad, which is hybrid versus the DevSecOps squad, which is CICD with security by design mindset. Platform engineering sounds to me like old ops squad. So uh, the way that I see it is that platform engineering is kind of the new term of uh, like umbrella term. So what would be kind of like a cloud platform mixed with SRE, mixed with et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All of these things are part of the, 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 the act of platform engineering. 
Uh, so you could have a specific uh, DevSecOps team if you want to call it that. I wouldn't. I wouldn't use DevOps as a team name, but you know. Uh, so I would see cloud cloud engineering or something like that. Uh, but uh, but it, it it would all fit into the the umbrella term of platform engineering in the way that I see it. So it's it's really just uh, it's one of the things we kind of have to deal with in in our line of work. Things change and things get new names, even though it's kind of the same. Uh, I think platform engineer uh, or platform engineering as a term is something that's that's come up relatively recently, and and it's uh, I think it's a more like holistic like approach to the what's now modern operations. Uh, so. Uh, it, it could mean a lot of things depending on where you're at. Let's just say that. Absolutely. Um, so great. We are at time. We want to uh, move on to our next speaker. So thank you so much, Robert. Thank, thank you for your questions. And I still see people typing. So um, uh, check it out and um, you'll be able to continue to chat with Robert. So thank you so much.